So Dr. Rex Crawford owns and operates Dufferin Veterinary Services near Orangeville in Ontario. Dr. Crawford graduated from the Ontario Veterinary College at the University of Guelph in 2005. Dr. Crawford has a special interest in sheep and goat health management and is currently president of the Small Ruminant Veterinarians of Ontario. Dr. Crawford consults and speaks on small ruminant health topics throughout Ontario. And I believe you're on the Medivisna Committee with Ontario Sheep. Yes, I'm on the technical committee, yeah. And Dufferin Veterinary Services offers a variety of services, semen collection, freezing for cattle, sheep, and goats. Um, Dr. Crawford was raised, at, and I love this name, <laughs> Croft Down Farms, a purebred shorthorn cattle and Suffolk sheep operation in Glencoe, so native to the area. And Dr. Crawford still enjoys helping out on the family farm, which has expanded to have 150 shorthorn and semitol cows. In his spare time, Dr. Crawford can be found judging cattle and sheep shows throughout Ontario and curling in the winter months. That sounds about a busy lifestyle. <laughs> it's good to be busy though, right? So, um, so we have quite a number of producers on with us tonight. Um, we are doing a little bit of meeting um, discussion at the end, but we do not want to hold you up. Um, if Tom would help us, how do we want to load Dr. Crawford's presentation? Or are you going to be able to share your screen? So I hope I'm going to be able to share my screen if Tom will let me. <laughs> yep, you should be able to just go to um, participants at the bottom and, uh, or sorry, uh, screen share at the bottom. Yep. And uh, it should pop up right there. And if you put it in presenter mode, um, it'll get rid of all of the uh, slides on the side that are coming up next. Perfect. It's loading now. Just. Do you have more than one screen, Rex? It may be. Oh. Um, it may be showing to an alternate screen. And now I see your uh, presentation. Oh, coming up there now. And I'm only from speaking from experience on that one. Um, <laughs> I only have one screen. I'm not that fancy, but it it was just showing a moment ago before you did that. If uh, if you go back to what you did, okay. And then if you if you go to slideshow at the top. Um, and click on that and then hit, um, I believe it's from the beginning. That should. It keeps coming up and saying my, sh your screen sharing is paused. Mm -hmm. um, the other option, if you go back to the, sorry, everyone, we'll figure this out in just a moment. If you go to, I'm just looking at your screen here. Um, What about hitting from current slide? Let's see what um, what that does. No, for some reason it uh, keeps kicking you out to that other one. Um, we may have to do the presentation from uh, the screen that we were just looking at. Just a second, let me try this again. Does that look better? There we go. Whatever you okay. did, perfect. And I don't know what I did, but it worked. <laughs> and maybe just for the purpose of recording, if uh, we want to do a quick introduction right now, that will be a clean start for um, for recording. Maybe if Rex, you just want to introduce yourself, that way sure. at least we have a clean uh, a clean recording. And uh, you bet, sounds great. So yeah, I'm Dr. Rex Crawford from Dufferin Veterinary Services in Amaranth, which is near Orangeville, Ontario, and I am a veterinarian here that uh, has a special interest in sheep and goats. Uh, that started in District 1. Um, as Sandra said, I grew up on a farm in 
uh, right near Glencoe, Ontario. So uh, my grandfather, Duncan Crawford, raised Suffolk sheep. So on the slide there, there's a very old picture of some of the Suffolks that I grew up with. And I'm happy to say that I've got a couple of nieces that are uh, keen to, to start their 4-H careers and they've got some Suffolk sheep around again. So uh, the Crop Down Suffolk sheep program consists of three yellow lambs at the moment, but um, it's kind of exciting to go in and help the girls with uh, some sheep down there in Glencoe as well. So, uh, so the talk for tonight is uh, successful lambing begins with preparation. So uh, we're gonna go through some stuff. I probably got way more slides here than we're gonna get through in the time. So I'm gonna try to get through the main stuff that takes us up to lambing day and then got some slides that probably we're going to say that's enough and stop, but uh, it never hurts to have a little bit of extra stuff in a presentation in case I talk fast and everything goes great. So what we're gonna try and talk about is preparing the yolk for lambing, uh, problems of late pregnancy, so pregnancy toxemia, hypocalcemia, vaginal prolapse, and no milk at lambing. And we might get into some lambing day, uh, lambing difficulties and prolapse uterus, but almost for sure we're gonna run out of time right about there. So, um, so some things that we have to think about when we're preparing uh, yolks for lambing, and I'm gonna mute my video things. So I'm going to stop recording me. You don't need to look at my ugly face anyway, as long as you can hear me. So um, so major changes to the yo's physiology uh, as she gets ready to lamb. So uh, nutrient requirements of those growing feti uh, inside her abdomen uh, are considerable uh, and require energy, protein, calcium, and a bunch of other things as well. But, but the Three of the big things we need to worry about are energy, protein, and calcium. That yo needs to prepare her udder for uh, making milk, and she needs to make colostrum ahead of time uh, of lambing. So again, that takes protein and energy, uh, takes other things as well. And if we don't do a good job of providing, uh, you know, particularly enough protein in that colostrum development phase, we'll have uh, small quantities of colostrum and, and probably not very high quality colostrum as well. Um, the lambs themselves become what we call space occupying parasites. So the lambs really do suck a lot out of the yo. Uh, as we get into the last two to three weeks before lambing, they take up a drastic amount of space in that abdomen and they reduce the amount of space that is available in the belly for uh, digestion of nutrients to occur. So the rumen uh, gets squished out of the way uh, the intestines kind of have to take up the room that they always take up, uh, but the, the yo's ability to continue to eat uh, the same amount of food as she does, say, a month or six weeks prior to lambing uh, is drastically different in those last two to three weeks. So we have to remember that lambs double their weight in the last four weeks before lambing, and that doesn't really matter a lot whether we're talking about one lamb in the uterus or whether we're talking about three or four lambs in there. Um, at lambing time, the lambs are about 60% of the weight of the total uterus and the contents. So the uterus itself and the fluid that's in there as well. So but we remember that if we, you know, we happen to have uh, three seven pound lambs inside a, a, a yo, that's 21 pounds of lamb. That's pretty easy to, to weigh. But we have to think about the fact that there's a bunch of that other stuff going on in there as well. So that's that might be 32 pounds of total uterine weight in that yolk. And if she weighs 150 pounds at that day of lambing, that's 21% of her body weight. So that's incredible uh, that it's in that, uh, in that package. So we have to you know, think of these girls as being pretty special, especially when we start putting multiple feta in there. Uh, dry matter intake because of that, uh, that space occupying uterus and, and fetuses in there, drops by about 30% in the last four weeks before lambing. So it's really important that we feed those yos as they get ready to lamb a really high quality, easily digestible forage uh, so that it's not hanging around in the rumen for a long time to get uh, chewed up and, and move onward. Um, it's also important that, that, we, that we get the nutrients in there. So, and we have to think about uh, things like acidosis or green overload if we get, if our yos continue to eat large amounts of grain, especially if we're feeding one grain meal a day and they're at a stage uh, of 
a full abdomen where they're not able to eat adequate amounts of forage. So we can get a, we can, we can induce an acidosis where we haven't changed the amount of grain being fed at all, but the percentage of the diet, uh, that grain feeding goes up quite a lot. <laughs> um, so another thing to think about here is if we're using uh, TMR feeding in these close lamb and yellows, uh, we have to be really cognizant of the fact that if we do a really good job of, of feeding TMR and making that TMR feed, that as feed intake drops, what looked like a really uh, perfect diet at 100% uh, dry matter intake we had four weeks before lambing turns into 70% of everything as they get close to lambing. So I'm, uh, I'm hesitant to, to fall totally in love with TMRs in that very late gestation period. And I'm, uh, I have a tendency to uh, think about taking at least some of the grain out of that TMR and feeding it separately uh, that allows us to ensure that we get uh, a bunch of that grain in, into the diet that we don't drop too much in, in our uh, concentrated feed uh, as our feed intake drops. The other reason I sometimes like to do that is I like to get yolks up twice a day to eat. And I think when we talk about pregnancy toxemia and hypocalcemia in a few minutes, um, that one of the simplest ways to decide if there's a yolk that might be getting in trouble early is who is the slowest one to get to the feed bunk when we feed. So if we only do that once a day with a TMR uh, feeder, that only gives us one opportunity to have an eye on those girls and see who's coming up to eat. The other thing that happens there is if we, if we drive twice a day uh, running at the manger, and we all know that uh, if two sheep run at the manger, all of the sheep in the pen are very likely to run to the manger. Um, oftentimes whether there's feed coming or not uh, they just run over in hopes that there might be something coming um, we can get uh, we might double the chances that a yellow whose appetite is not great decides to eat so uh, getting those girls up and, and moving towards feed might actually increase our feed intake a little bit on some of those girls that are that are borderline getting in trouble so uh, so things, again, we need to think about nutrition for these late gestation yolks. Um, we may need to separate yolks by requirements to do a really good job, or if we're struggling with some of these things, this is some things to think about. So you might want to separate some thin yolks off uh, from the group so they don't have to compete as much for the same feed. Um, they may have had problems in the past that's causing them to be skinny. They may have other issues going on that, that may mean we want to, uh, we may not even feed those girls differently. We might just feed them in a different pen so they have definite opportunity to go and eat. Uh, we might pen our yo lambs separately uh, through lambing and maybe even through that first uh, lactation phase of their life um, so that that we can make sure that they are able to continue growing while they're, uh, while they're looking after those lambs. Uh, we can certainly think about and have the discussion about multiple lamb. Uh, in other parts of the world, it's very popular to uh, separate singles from twins and feed those groups uh, separately and, and, and differently. In, our, in some of our uh, more extensive sheep operations, uh, where we expect a lot of singles, uh, it's important to not overfeed those single bearing yolks so that we can, so that we don't create really, really big lambs. And it's also wasteful in systems where there's not very much extra money. Uh, so if we can, if we can save a few cents on feed uh, for those single bearing yolks, that, that seems like it's worthwhile. And, but in places where separating uh, singles from twins is normal, those are in places where we're talking about 30 to 50% of the yellows bearing singles uh, and essentially the balance bearing twins with a very occasional set of triplets. Uh, in our prolific sheep that many of us work with here in Ontario, it's more common for us to see uh, more triplets than, than we do singles. And our groups, uh, if, we're, if we're only sorting off the singles, start to be a pretty small pan of sheep that 
may not feel like it's very worthwhile. It's very difficult when we're scanning uh, for pregnancy and, and trying to count fetuses. It's very difficult to uh, separate twins from triplets accurately. And certainly if we're trying to find, um, you know, if we're trying to draw the line at four instead of three, it gets even harder uh, to do accurately and well. Um, it's not that it can't be attempted, but very often uh, producers who are trying to do this find that they have as many triplets in the twin pen as they, and, you know, and a bunch of twins in the triplet pen. So we didn't, we didn't, if it was really critical to do that sort, we probably didn't do it well enough to really make a big difference. Um, and I'm not sure nutritionally that, that we, that we know how much extra to feed those triplet bearing nose as well, or that we can even get it into them necessarily. So, um, think about forage analysis in a year like this year, I think that's, uh, probably really critical. Um, it gives us an opportunity to know what we have available to us to work with. Uh, it allows us to select our best forages for that pre-lambing and early lactation period. And it allows the nutritionist to help us and actually balance our action uh, for different stages of gestation and lactation. Without doing that forage analysis, a nutritionist is totally guessing. Uh, so, you know, using average forage qualities doesn't doesn't allow us to, to actually balance a ration. We're just guessing based on averages. So, um, so I think uh, forage analysis is almost always uh, worth doing, particularly if we've got any any size of flock. If, if we're feeding 10 yos, uh, is forage analysis going to pay us? Probably not. But if we're feeding 100, uh, it does, I think, really quickly allow us to uh, to to use the right forages at the right time and to uh, if we made really good hay or very good forages it's going to save us on some grain and if we haven't made forage as good as we thought then we're going to spend a bit more money on grain or, or other supplements but we but we need to to look after our sheep well and to, to let them uh, reach their their best potential for us so uh, but, and, you know, I say it again, best forage quality on the farm, you know, for simple math, what, what do we do if we don't want to talk to that nutritionist? Uh, we feed a, about a pound of corn a day with free choice, high quality second or maybe even third cut hay and, um, you know, and, and we roll on from there. Uh, if we, you know, if we're in a situation where we don't have any second cut hay or it's all disappeared on us or something like that and we're feeding first cut hay, I think we just need to make sure then that we we pick the forage that that is at the least mature has the lowest NDF is the, is the thing that we would look at to tell us how much fiber is in there and how slowly it's going to work its way through the rumen. And uh, for the period of time that we're talking about here, which is really you know three to four weeks ahead of lambing, um, so we might be talking about five or six weeks total getting us through an awful big chunk of our of our lambing group, um, it might be worth buying some hay for that short period of time. If we don't have what we need, uh, it might save us a lot of headaches versus trying to feed stuff that's not going to allow us to, to do a very good job for these girls. Um, we already, I already did this talk about the TMR that that big difference in energy intake if if we drop that dry matter intake a lot. And so, if we're going to use a TMR in late gestation, I think the thing we need to uh, be cognizant of, of is what are those feed intakes and I think um, if a nutritionist hasn't given us a plan uh, based on a moving target of feed intake then I think it's important that if we're more than probably 10 to maybe 15 percent lower in, in our amount of feed consumed in a day versus what the, what the nutritionist is outlined for us, then we need to be on the phone to them and say, hey, my intakes are dropping. Do I need to make some adjustments here uh, because of because of that lower feed intake? And, and that can be done where where we will play with those levels or we, you know, we we make some recommended adjustments based on on what feed intake is like. That gets really hard when we get to the, you know, 
the uh, a week or so into lambing where we have where every day it seems like we have no idea how many sheep we actually fed in the close-up pen because every hour we're going in and pulling more yos out of that group so it was like well i don't know like there was it was 62 when I fed this morning and there's 56 tonight. So I don't know how many sheep I fed today. So it even gets hard to do what that what that daily intake is once we start into a real role of laying. Bunk space is really important uh, for that close up period and making sure that everybody is able to eat what they should uh, and get there at the same time. I'm a big believer that sheep have to eat at the same time if you know, really no matter how we're feeding them, anything that we want them to eat uh, that is going to disappear. So if we're grain feeding, if we're TMR feeding, if we're silage feeding, we need those yos all to be able to eat that at once. Uh, if we're round bale hay feeding, we probably don't need every sheep to be able to eat at that round bale at the same time because it's going to be there all day and it's okay uh, as long as it's actually there all day. So if we're you know uh, these close-up girls are girls that we never ever ever run our uh, our hay feeders empty we want to see some hay there all the time we're maybe going to waste a little bit but that's life we want to look after these girls and we don't want a period of time where they're like oh i could eat now but i can't because there's nothing there so um Best time to observe for appetite is immediately after feeding, and the slowest ones to get to the feed are the ones to watch close. We've said that already. Um, other things to think about: freshly shorn sheep require more nutrients, uh, especially in cold weather. Uh, we've taken their wool coat away, so we need to think about the fact that they need to have uh, a little bit of increase in nutrition because we've shorn them. Uh, cold has a big impact on nutrient requirements and will increase dry matter intake drastically in the short term, if it can, right? As long as we've got room in there, but if we don't have room, then we're, then we're stuck. Uh, extreme heat, so if we're lambing in July, uh, we need to think about the fact that when it's really hot, we don't want to eat. Um, and, and it's going to take a very little bit more uh, nutrient requirements to, for a sheep to deal with being hot. Um, if, if we're into that summertime lambing, uh, feeding at cooler parts of the day to increase, to encourage intake, um, considering fans for cooling if, if lambing when it's really hot so that we can make those girls feel better and keep going the best we can. Um, other things to think about preparing for, uh, providing a clean, dry environment, making sure that teats are clean to reduce lambs sucking manure as their first meal. So uh, that's something we need to think about you know, a month or two or three ahead of lambing. We can't leave them in a slop hole till two weeks before they lamb and then bed like crazy. Uh, and we're still going to have some dirty udders. So we want to think about that. Uh, think about shearing. I, it's easier for lambs to find teats without wool in the way. Uh, if, if situations lend themselves not to shearing completely, crutching is a reasonable thing to do so that we uh, remove wool from the rump and the belly so that we don't have a mess from at the back end during lambing and that we've got as much wool away from the other as we can to make that go simple. And, and so especially if we're, if those yellows are going to an outsider or, or, you know, pretty ambient temperature environment uh, soon after they lamb, uh, then we probably don't want to shear them completely, but, but crutching is a good alternative to that. So uh, moving on to problems of late pregnancy, we'll talk about pregnancy toxemia, hypocalcemia, we'll talk about vaginal prolapse a little bit, and we'll talk about the no milk disease. So what does pregnancy toxemia look like? This is off feed yos, close to lambing, so last two weeks, maybe three weeks, uh, who eventually uh, can't stand up and eventually die. So if we find a uh, uh, pregnancy toxemia yo at the very early stages, she just is slow to come to eat. Or she comes to the feeder, but she actually doesn't eat. She just looks at the food and says, yeah, I don't feel like it. Um, if we find them later than that, we find a yo who can't stand up, no matter how much we help her, no matter what we do. And likely we're going to find her in that stage, not 
when she's dead, but we might find her at the can't stand stage and tomorrow she's dead. Um, so, you know, that can happen for sure. Uh, if you read things about pregnancy toxemia from the United Kingdom, uh, they call it twin lamb disease, and they will talk about things that affect the brain, so neurologic, so those she will be blind, they will be staggering, they will be what's called stargazing, so looking up towards the stars, uh, look like they're high as a kite on something, and those things, in my mind, are related to what I call pure hypoglycemia, so purely not enough blood sugar. Um, and we, I don't think we see that pure form here the same. I think our sheep tend to, and I'll talk about it in a minute, to see more of the hyperketonemia or the ketosis side of things um, than that true low blood sugar brain effect. So if a yo is not consuming enough energy to support the growth of her feti, uh, she starts to mobilize Just looking into that, if uh, anyone has their mic on, if they can just mute. Sorry, Dr. Crawford. If you want, if you want to go ahead. Rex is still on mute. Yep, Cut. I'm just asking him here to uh, unmute. Hopefully that. Uh, there we go. go I hit Rex. the unmute button. We can hear you. <laughs> We're back. We're good. 10 for. Okay. For the third time, EPO is not consuming enough energy um, to support the, both her own functions and the growth of the feti. What her body tells her to do is to mobilize her body fat. Um, and um, to use that energy. So the fat is sent to the liver. The liver is the processing factory to turn, uh, to turn fat, or it actually moves through the body as cholesterol um, to the liver. And then that, the liver does the job of making that into useful energy. Now I'm gonna try to see this. Um, so if the liver receives more fat than it can process completely, uh, byproducts known as ketones are produced and released into the blood. So there's three, a thing called beta hydroxybutyrate or BHB for short, acetoacetate and acetone. So acetone is what uh, some of us use to remove our nail polish. I say as if I have ever done that. And uh, so it's that smelling stuff. And so some people can actually smell acetone on the breath of animals that have pregnancy toxemia or ketosis. I cannot very well, so that's not a good judge for me, but I certainly have uh, dairy cow clients that can tell me when uh, a cow has the cow form of this ketosis uh, by smelling her breath. But what those ketone bodies do in the body of the sheep are they lead to poor appetite, lethargy and depression. So it's a touch backwards. Uh, when things are not going great for the sheep energy wise, uh, we've mobilized that fat. One of the things that mobilizing that fat does is make you not want to eat as much, which then progresses you further down the pathway towards death rather than getting much better. So uh, it's a bit tricky. Um, so, so we get and we can actually get, if this cycle goes on enough, we can actually get a fat uh, overdose in the liver. So, so a disease that in cows, at least, we call fatty liver, and one that we don't necessarily recognize in sheep as a syndrome, but it, but it certainly is, is part of this pregnancy toxemia cascade. So what that means is that fat yolks are more susceptible to pregnancy toxemia than thin yolks. They've got more fat so they can move it to the liver faster. Uh, being fat, 
uh, triggers a hormone called leptin production, which is an appetite suppressant on its own. Uh, so that's not great. And if you're fat enough, you actually also have reduced abdominal space. And if you've ever opened up a sheep that has died uh, for a postmortem examination uh, and looked at the abdomen of a sheep that you think is either in normal body condition or that you know was on the chubby side of happy and you see all of the fat in the abdomen you're like oh gosh like we've got another you know lamb's worth of body space taken up here just in the amount of fat sitting in the abdomen so uh so that's something to think about as well and something that i don't think without opening up we really realize how many yellows that we think are that, that we would call normal in their body condition three and a half four kind of body condition on the outside and see how much fat that turns into on the inside. So how are we going to treat pregnancy toxemia? The first step is early detection, because if we wait for those yellows to be uh, down and, and totally off feed, our success rate on them is going to be somewhere close to zero. Um, if we find them early, so that's those girls that are sluggish to get up and eat, but still coming up to eat, um, that's the time that, that we can probably have an impact with treatment. So what do we want to do? The first thing we need to do is provide an energy source. So my preferred energy source is propylene glycol. And um, we then, then how much do we give and what do we give? Uh, propylene glycol over the last couple of years has actually changed its strength um, or at least in the one that I used we used to use a product called glycol P that had some other cool ingredients in it which meant that it was two-thirds glycol and a third other things um, and it is now off the market so we use the products we use now are 100% propylene glycol so we can actually move from um, we can move down from 50 mils twice a day to 35 mils, and we're essentially getting the same amount of glycol. Um, so, so that's an oral drench with a liquid. Uh, there's also kind of a neat product called Ketamol, uh, which doesn't have any research on it, but it is a reasonable energy source. It is made out of the malting process. It smells wonderful. Uh, propylene glycol smells awful, and nobody likes to drink it. Um, so. Some producers prefer ketamol because they think it stimulates the appetite and at least sheep don't hate it. Um, so that's a reasonable thing to do. Very little research to say how, how those two products compare as far as, as what they really um, do in the body. Um, there's some research work to show that uh, there are some concentrated electrolyte solution products um, that contain a bunch of uh, dextrose and or propylene glycol and um, some calcium and some other electrolytes as well. So there, there's been some evidence to show that that can work really well if you can find one of those products as well. Um, and uh -oh, lost the slide there. Uh, in a pinch, molasses or corn syrup will do, uh, but they are not good for the rumen bugs. So um, they are uh, not the preferred thing to use uh, and will co could cause some issues. And uh, what else might we want to do? There's some good research to show that pain control uh, is probably a good idea on these girls. Uh, there's some older work to using banamine as the, as the painkiller um, to show that, that that improves the success of these girls somewhat. So uh, at this point in time, my preferred is to use Medicam uh, because A, it's labeled for sheep and we can give it under the skin and it is going to last probably three to four times as long as the shot of Banamine. Uh, shot of Banamine is going to last somewhere in the eight to 12 hours range. Uh, in Medicam, we're going to get over 24 hours and probably somewhere in the order of 36 hours off of one shot. So um, pretty nice that way. Uh, I usually recommend giving calcium to these girls uh, as the, the injectable calcium, calcium borogluconate, uh, 50 mils under the skin, one to two times per day, partially because when we're treating these girls early, 
in uh, stages of pregnancy toxemia, I might not always be sure that I'm not treating a hypocalcemia case. And these girls, once they go somewhat off feed, uh, their calcium is very likely to drop pretty quickly. So I think it's worth giving that calcium. It's not super expensive. Uh, we might give dexamethasone uh, to induce lambing. Uh, it also has some good effects on the, the liver um, and that making of blood glucose. Um, if we do this too early, then we're likely to have dead lambs form. Um, but we've increased the chance that mom lives. So that's uh, sometimes more important than hanging on for another four or five days and, and having dead everything. Um, you expect to help with lambing these girls if we're going to induce lambing. They're likely to not progress to a super normal lambing. So they might start and then not progress. So uh, pulling lambs is probably something to be pretty prepared for if we do that induction. If we're more than about five days ahead of due date on lambing, the dexamethasone will have probably no effect on inducing the lambing or very, it will be very sporadic whether it works or not. So we've got to be pretty close to get the dexamethasone to work very well. Uh, intravenous dextrose is something that we can use um, at least theoretically. Uh, it is the best thing to mimic um, the sheep's own normal blood sugar, but to do that properly, it needs to be given as a drip and not as a bolus. So giving 50 milliliters of dextrose IV uh, in 15 seconds does not do anything helpful. That gives the sheep a sugar high that then crashes, and that's not going to be very helpful. This is something that if we were going to do it, would need to be like on over 12 hours or something like that. Um, the dextrose. We might think about giving some vitamins to some of these girls. And again, this is out there in the not sure how much benefit it makes, but there's at least some sense to uh, why we might do it. So vitamin B12 is known as an appetite stimulant in ruminants. So that might be worth giving. Uh, things like new cells and Vitamaster uh, that some of you might have on farm for some other things contain vitamin B12 and a bunch of other minerals. So that might be what uh, what we choose to use as our adjunct treatment as well. Uh, think about supportive care for these girls. So segregated from the big group so they don't have to compete for feed. My preference is to separate a yell with a buddy rather than alone. We think like a sheep alone is bad. Um, my grandpa always said you could never sell anybody one sheep. You had to sell them at least two. Uh, so they liked each other and three was better because one might die. So, um, so so think about separating them from the big group, but but maybe two or three sheep in there, not just one, or she might decide that she's the last sheep in the world and give up. Um, think about warm water to encourage drinking and more or less whatever those yells will eat. So this is the time to kind of do a bit of a smorgasbord and bring some different hay in. Um, you know, if they don't eat their grain right away, maybe just leave it there. You know, we don't want to put five pounds of green in there, but um, but offering them some stuff and then leaving it there if they don't show interest right now is an okay thing to do. So moving on to hypocalcemia, um, working here. So this is milk fever in cattle. Um, so the difference between sheep and cows is that sheep are more likely to get low calcium uh, prior to lambing than they are at lambing or after lambing. Uh, in cows, the, the big difference in calcium need is when they start to fill the udder, usually for the second time. So the colostrum has been harvested from that cow either by being sucked or by being milked out. And then the rush of calcium needed to, to fill that udder, refill that udder with milk uh, is when they get in trouble. The amount of bone that a sheep makes to make two or three lambs in the last two to three weeks of gestation is enormous. So her calcium needs are prior to lambing and they're as that feed intake is starting to drop. So, uh, so calcium is a, a thing we need to be thinking about uh, in these girls. Uh, if we've got hypocalcemia in sheep, they'll be down or weak on their legs. 
they'll be cold, they'll have very little manure or urine production. Um, if we want to get really fancy and we shine a light in their eyes, they might actually be slow to dilate their pupils because the pupil dilation is a, is a muscular contraction. So uh, we can sometimes actually measure that in their eye or compare that to a normal sheep and see if we think that's there. Um, often it happens in conjunction with pregnancy toxemia. So my treatment plans for both diseases generally try to cover both diseases so that we, if we're wrong, uh, we still have positive effect. Um, so as long as we've got enough calcium in the diet, the risk should be low. Um, anything that decreases our feed intake increases our risk of hypocalcemia. Older yellows are more likely to get in trouble and particularly from our knowledge from the cow side, other minerals, uh, the most important one being potassium, can affect the way the body is able to use the calcium in their body or to release calcium from their bones into their bloodstream. Um, so if we've got the option using a low potassium hay in our close up diet uh, can help um, uh, the body's ability to use the calcium that they have. How are we going to treat hypocalcemia? We're going to give uh, calcium monogluconate sub Q or under the skin. So 50 milliliters every six to 12 hours for three to four treatments uh, should be sufficient. If we're comfortable giving uh, an IV injection, IV injection is probably better, uh, but finding the vein, usually we're going to use the jugular vein in the neck of a sheep can be tricky. And if we don't do it well, we can kill them. So it, we would give 40 to 50 milliliters slowly. So that would be over um, probably two to three minutes. Um, definitely not 12 seconds. Um, or what happens is we get too much calcium going to the heart. Uh, calcium helps with muscle contraction. If we get too much calcium all in one place, the heart contracts, but it forgets to relax so that it can contract, contract again and have a pumping action, which is what the heart does. So if the heart doesn't do that, then it stops and then your blood flow stops and then you're dead. Um, if we're going to give IV calcium, we still need to follow up with a second source. So we need to give, usually I would give uh, calcium under the skin at the same time as I gave IV calcium so that, um, that we, because what, what, ha what happens with the IV calcium similar to that that sugar rush story is that the calcium is going to go well above normal with that IV injection. And then the body gets confused, thinks it's got lots and stops doing the things it usually does to keep acquiring calcium for the bloodstream. So having lots of calcium there, the secondary source under the skin can trickle in slowly um, is pretty much necessary. We can also sometimes use oral calcium products. So uh, Tums for people, uh, contains mostly calcium, so they can actually work. Um, some of those electrolyte solutions we talked about earlier are fairly high in calcium. Uh, I tend to shy away from some of the calcium pastes that are available mostly for cattle because they tend to be made of things that are quite um, acidic in their pH and they're very caustic, so they cause they can cause ulceration burns in the mouth. Um, and then we've got a sheep that's not wanting to eat all that well with a sore mouth, so they're really not going to eat that. So I tend to avoid those. Um, I put on this slide calcium boroglucanate for both of those uh, treatments. Um, there are other calcium solutions that have other things in them. So there's some that are the most common one is called cow mag foss, or there's a cow dex um, that have they have incredibly small amounts of magnesium and phosphorus in them and they also have dextrose in them um, and that dextrose in those products makes them um, sting a lot if we give them under the skin so we should have, we should never use those products under the skin if we can help it and there's really no advantage to having those other things in the IV treatment so it's much simpler to have one bottle on hand that is the calcium barbecue um so monitoring nutrition in late gestation um so body condition score is the cheapest monitor but it can change it without us noticing especially if we've got woolly sheep because the only way to body condition score a sheep properly is to touch them 
especially if they haven't been shown in the last month. Um, so touching our sheep on a regular basis can help a lot. Um, and sometimes it actually helps a lot to have a neighbor or a friend help us with body condition scoring that doesn't see our sheep all the time because it's much easier for somebody that sees our sheep once a week or every couple of weeks to notice that they change body condition than it is for those of us who are there feeding every day because those slight changes build up over time and we don't notice. Um, early in subclinical or, or not all the way to sickness, pregnancy toxemia can be monitored through blood testing. Um, so we can use uh, BHB test strips. We can test for that ketone that's called BHB with a meter that, so we use, we normally use a meter that's actually designed for diabetic people. Um, so you can actually buy the machine and the test strips at the drugstore and use them. Um, and we can begin monitoring as early as four weeks pre-lambing. We can, if we start to notice changes, then it rises in that BHB at four weeks uh, prior to lambing, then we know we're headed down a path of trouble if we don't sort things out pretty quick. Um, so if we're gonna do that, we would test usually about six yos, um, three to four weeks uh, prior to lambing. Oh, and I'm getting unstable. That thing, Tom. Can you still hear me? Yep, that I can. Okay, good. Um, so we want to test about six sheep three to four weeks prior to lambing, and so the numbers on here are probably not critical for you guys. But um, if we're less than zero point eight uh, at three to four weeks before lambing, then we're in good shape. Uh, we might go up to 1.1 if we knew that they had twins or and almost for sure triplets in there. That's going to be normal-ish. Um, 0.8 to 1.6 is considered subclinical pregnancy toxemia. And uh, 1.6 uh, is going to be considered clinical pregnancy toxemia. And those sheep are really close to in trouble if they're not already in trouble. So if we saw... Uh, more than two out of six sheep with a number above 1.1 at that three to four weeks prior to lambing, we would know that we needed to make some changes to our nutrition program uh, pretty quickly to uh, get things under control. Um, and there are there is a neat graph that um, some folks in the UK have put together on what they consider normal for um, I think I was as far as about six weeks prior to lambing. So um, that gets hard in a, in a regularly naturally mated group. One of the challenges always is to know uh, when you are actually due. Um, so if you're right, if it's two weeks before the start of lambing, but you're not going to lamb until two weeks into lambing, then you're four weeks away. But if it's two weeks before lambing, and you're going to lamb on the first day, then you're only two weeks away. So that gets a little hard to judge sometimes and isn't isn't critical to, to making this work. Um, so that that's just a little bit about monitoring there. So if pregnancy toxemia is an issue in your flock, this is something to talk about working through with your vet um, to say, hey, can you, you know, can you come help me do this? Can you, you know, can you help me do this? You know, you, a bunch of us that do dairy work like that already have one of these um, test kits and, and can do this pretty easy on farm. And it's a, it's a neat thing to do um, if this is a concern. So I've got a couple of places where we do this kind of regularly to make sure that we're not in trouble where they've had pretty big issues in the past. Um, but it's not something that we do certainly on every farm for sure. So. Uh, vaginal prolapse. So that lovely pink ball sticking out from underneath the tail of that sheep. Um, vaginal prolapse occurs as some combination between too much abdominal pressure, starting to strain and then forgetting to stop, and weak muscle structure in the rear end of the sheep. So those things combine to put us at risk of vaginal prolapse. So what causes too much abdominal pressure? Too many lambs in there, so as we certainly as we go over three, um, 
abdominal pressure is going to increase with lambs in there for sure. Um, low quality as in too much fiber feed. Um, so that's that high NDF hay. Um, we would, in my mind, never put straw in the diet of a close-up sheep. I think you'd be crazy um, and, or, and, and things like that. So not necessarily low quality from a protein standpoint, but just too much bulk and fiber so that it takes longer to pass through that room and, and builds up in there. Overweight sheep are a risk because, because of that abdominal fat that we talked about before. Elevated feeding, so uh, anybody feeding in a uh, renovated barn where we've left mangers in the same spot they used to be for the cows um, or anything that we've built that, that ends up with a step for the front feet to sit on before while we're eating uh, is going to put a lot of pressure on the back end of the sheep. Um, hill pasture can do this. Um, so if we've got a hilly pasture, um, sheep tend to prefer to lay uphill and it's actually probably smarter for being able to get up and not, you know, somersault down the hill as we're trying to get up. Um, but that puts increased pressure on the back. I used to have a client, a cow client that had a very hilly pasture where they calved their cows and they uh, tended to have what, what I would consider as um, high risk cows and that they had Hereford cattle and Hereford cattle are at least some lines of Hereford cattle are more prone to vaginal prolapse than other breeds of cattle. And we would do two or three vaginal prolapses on 20 cows there virtually every year. So um, just hilly pasture can do it. Um, if we have, for some reason, a big hill pack, uh, mound or something like that can do it as well to increase pressure. Straining, why does a sheep strain? Why does a chicken cross the road? Um, things to think about though are infection of vaginal tissue, bladder infection perhaps, um, and the, this makes things worse once a small prolapse has started. So we, if we get a little prolapse that's coming in and out, we can get some infection of that tissue that then causes it to be irritating and that causes more pushing, which causes a bigger prolapse, which then, you know, onward and onward we go. Weak muscle structure. So there is some research to show that short tails increase the risk by changing muscle development in that area around the tail. Um, some of those muscles that help with the, with the swishing of the tail. Um, and when we talk about short tails here, we're talking about really short tails, like no tail at all uh, as being the biggest risk, but, but really anything short enough that we take um, those tail webs off um, is an increase for vaginal prolapse. And I know there's lots of fighting about tails in the sheep world, and I'm just going to leave it at that. There's a genetic component likely in uh, differences between in their muscle and pelvic shape as well. Uh, things that aren't, I don't think, very well uh, understood. When we talk about Herefords and the risk of prolapse, um, it, that's partly uh, due to decreased muscle shape in that rear end. Um, if we want to make Herefords prolapse worse, we don't let them have any exercise. So we don't let them do anything to build up muscle and keep muscle there. Um, I have one other client that uh, still ties his cows up all winter and he has more vaginal prolapses because those cows don't get any exercise. So their, uh, their muscle shape and size is not the same as regular cows. Um, I have a guy that has almost the same genetics as that client that leaves his cows outside and he has some cedar bush and he has a big giant hill that those cows have to walk up and down and he i don't know that we've ever treated a vaginal prolapse at his place in the, uh 15 years or so that i've been helping him so um that you know there's lots of little things there that can make a difference what are we going to do for that vaginal prolapse we're going to clean it we're going to replace it uh and uh, so we're going to do that the first time it is observed to be out and doesn't go back in after the yellow is standing up for five minutes. So some vaginal prolapses will be very small 
and we'll go back in every time the sheep stands up and those we should just leave alone um I give an epidural to help us replace vaginal prolapses generally speaking if i go to put a vaginal prolapse back in i give an epidural um and that's something you can talk about with your vet about whether whether it's worth um you learning how to do that <coughs> if we're going to do that uh, i usually use around one mil of lidocaine three quarters of a mil is actually probably enough and one and a half mils is probably too much in regular size sheep um and certainly we don't want to be giving three or four milliliters i use four milliliters in a cow so we don't want to go up that much or if we actually get the epidural space correctly we'll paralyze the back end of that sheep and then that doesn't help us all that much um i think it's a great idea to give these vaginal prolapse you know, genetic cam so it can help decrease some of the inflammation in that vaginal tissue that might make them feel enough better to decrease or stop straining I am not convinced that we need to give every vaginal prolapse yo antibiotics. There are veterinarians who advocate that that say there's an that by the time we're replacing them, there's enough infection likely in that vaginal tissue that they might have uh, a bladder infection. That let's just let's just cover them and be safe. And that's not wrong, but it's so that's another discussion to have with your vet about whether that's something that you should add to your protocol or not. Uh, and I think probably most importantly, reducing that abdominal pressure by offering our very best hay to those girls, thinking about where we're feeding. Did we just clean out the barn, which means that we're working harder to get to feed in the manger or things like that, um, that we can maybe make a change to make better. How are we going to keep the prolapse in? Um, so my preferred method to do this is a prolapse harness with or without a retainer spoon um, that prolapse harness decreases the ease of straining against the prolapse so it squishes the belly in such a way that pushing doesn't feel fun um, i like the harnesses and the spoons because the yos can lamb with it still in place um, there are commercial harnesses available that are very nice or you can make them from twine and if we're going to make them from twine Get some big square bale twine, the really big stuff. It works nice. Uh, do not use, uh, if your round baler still has twine on it and you still have twine round bales, A net wrap is beautiful. Give it a try. I don't think you'll ever go back. Um, and B, it's not thick enough to make a uh, harness properly. So there is a description and I'm really sorry to say that I drew that picture and you can understand why I'm a veterinarian and not a world famous artist um, based on that picture. But if we're gonna do this, we use about 12 feet of twine. We start with the middle of that 12 feet at the neck and we cross the ends. Uh, with, so we, we drop it down the neck uh, and we cross at the brisket, um, bring it behind the front legs and we cross again behind the ribs and then we pass uh, the twine uh, between the udder and the inside of the rear legs um, and then we run the ends back up over the back of the sheep and um, tie up top there and then we can tie some short pieces just above and below the vulva and then we tighten our big strings up so as i say so the sheep can just hardly breathe maybe not, you know, not so tight they can't breathe, but pretty tight. Um, and then we can add a, we can add a vaginal retaining spoon um, into that as well, if we would like. In my hands, a vaginal retaining spoon on its own uh, is not wonderful, unless you've got a woolly sheep and you can tie it directly to the wool. Um, you can sometimes make a small retaining harness that will work okay. Um, or the full harness, I think, is a better way to go. If we're going to stitch the vulva on a vaginal prolapse sheep, um, we can do two different stitches. One's called a blanket stitch and one's called a funer stitch. The downside of doing that is that we have to get that stitch out when the yoke starts to lamb or we will end up with dead lambs because they can't push their way out of the vaginal vault. Um, so that can be tricky. Um, and it can be tricky to decide whether that yell that has a vaginal prolapse is pushing because she wants to get her prolapse back out or she's starting to lamb. Uh, and 
realistically, the only way to be sure of that most of the time is to see placenta or see water bag out. Uh, and then it's like a right away problem. So that's why I tend to prefer to use the spoon and harness uh, combo or your harness alone. Uh, moving on to no milk, and we're probably going to make this as the last thing and cut off that other stuff so we don't take up your whole entire night. Um, so why might we not have any milk at lambing or no colostrum there, even more importantly? So mastitis in the previous lambing or um, after weaning is likely the most common reason for this. And things to think about if we're, if we're wanting to blame uh, mastitis for our lack of colostrum or lack of milk in the udder at lambing, um, we want to think about is there lumps, abscesses, something that feels scarred in that udder. Um, Often this is going to be only one side. It can happen as both sides, but but most often we're going to have one normal half of the other and one one side that is not functional. Very occasionally we will get just a blocked T end or T canal, and the udder itself will be normal uh, as part of infection of some kind. It might more be injury related than than infection on its own as mastitis. Um, so sometimes if our udder feels very normal, but we can't get any milk out of the teat, if it feels like we've got, you know, something thick in the middle of the teat, um, down the whole length, like it feels like it has the inside of a pen shoved up in there, then that's going to be a blockage up the whole canal. If the teat itself feels normal, well, when you look at the end, we've got no hole. Um, occasionally that can be just a blocked teat end. And sometimes if we use a, you know, an 18 gauge, regular hypodermic needle um, right at the point where that teeth should be open. Sometimes we can unblock them if it's just very much at the surface of the skin, but that's not super common for sure. Uh, other reasons to have no milk or very little milk often in the case of maybe business virus, maybe business also known as hard bag. So we generally what we get with those yo's is we get a symmetrical filling of the udder with lymphocytes or white blood cells that, that is fills the udder up with with stuff similar to scar tissue, but that udder will look uh, look full or normal from a distance. But if we feel it, it will feel harder than normal. Not hard as a rock, but harder than normal. And when we start and when we try to get milk out of those girls, we'll either get five or six spurts of milk, and then that's it, or we'll get nothing at all out of those girls. Normally, this is a problem of older yos and not of younger yos because uh, uh, damage to the udder takes a number of years generally to, to cause enough problem that we're going to notice it as an issue in the udder. Um, and we can, in the intermediate stages of a maybe business infected udder, we'll get decreased milk production, but we'll still have milk there that we can't um, recognize as less than normal other than maybe we know that her lambs don't do well we think she's fine but her lambs grow very very poor uh other reasons for no colostrum or no milk there those that are uh deficient in protein especially sometimes along with energy uh just don't have enough building blocks to make uh, good colostrum, so they will have some colostrum there, but it'll be in small amounts. So we'll have not a very full udder. Sometimes it's very thick stuff that's in there, uh, so it can be an issue. The udder is going to feel normal. There's not going to be any lumps or bumps or ick in it. It's not going to feel hard. It's going to feel empty. Um, so that can be an issue. If we can keep those lambs alive, often these yos will come to milk in a few days because they can start to eat better. Now that they haven't got lambs taking up all the space in their abdomen and they will come to milk, but we've got to make sure that those lambs stay alive to that point. And in many of our systems, that means we've already taken that lamb away from its mother. And um, so we've, we've sort of given up there. So this is often something that happens as a flock level problem. So this is like 10, 20, 30% of our yolks are not coming into milk properly, not one or two usually. Um, so that can be an issue. So again, that's a revisit of our nutrition plan to fix that and go from there. 
Um, occasionally, we have struggle with milk letdown in particularly in nervous young lambs who are just terrified of the whole process of having a baby and looking at a baby and this baby wants to suck me and they um, freak right out um, and won't let their milk down. They've got milk there. They just won't let it down in their udder. This is probably the only, this is for sure the only one of these diseases or syndromes that oxytocin is going to help. So small amounts of injectable oxytocin uh, can help stimulate milk let down in those yolks, but that shouldn't be the first thing we reach for when we're struggling. If we're struggling with milk in yolks, um, this and almost for sure this is going to be a yolk that is, you know, looking absolutely terrified. She's going to be shaking in the corner or looking for ways to jump out of her pen. This is more upset even than the stompy yolk that's like everybody leave me alone because I don't want you here right now. This is like a terrifying no, no time with these. Uh, so if we're in trouble, we need to supplement with either fresh uh, frozen cloth or fresh colostrum from somebody else, frozen colostrum that we got in the freezer or a powdered colostrum replacers. Remember that if we use colostrum replacers, they don't include clostridium or pulpy kidney antibodies. So we need to think about those lambs as needing vaccination sooner than the rest of our group. Uh, mix according to the directions, but feed twice as much as they tell you. Feed lots, uh, particularly at the first and maybe the second feeding. The first feeding of colostrum is by far and away the most critical. So making sure we get enough into them at the beginning is the most important. After two feedings of colostrum replacers, there's not a big advantage to continuing on a colostrum replacer rather than milk replacer. And I think we will stop there and